Hi there, welcome to our session for a fireside chat that I'm doing here with Laszlo Bach, who many of you probably know, uh, who was the former chief people officer with Google. He writes a book, uh, Work Rules, that book does incredibly well. He can tell us more about that. And uh, goes off and found, uh, is the founder of Puma, which we're gonna learn more about, uh, a little bit more about what that business is in light of um, and what they're doing in light of all the things that are going on in the world today. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Welcome, Lazo. It's great to actually be here with you chatting. Great to be here virtually. I can't wait till we get to do it in person. I know. It seems like we should be in San Diego or nice weather or something. This is kind of, you know, like I'm here in Boston and you're somewhere on the planet. <laughs> Not in San Diego. Here in San Diego. Okay. So uh, we're going to kick off and we're going to have a conversation here back and forth, but we want to be taking questions um, from folks. So uh, if you do have any questions, put them, please put them forward and um, we'll be sure to get to them in, as we get into the conversation. Um, Lazo, I kind of wanted to dive right in to chat a little bit about at the heart of the matter for some of the things that you're doing, researching, talking about and working on your company. That change is so difficult. We all know that changing behavior is incredibly difficult. Changing a company, really, really hard. So this is something we've been trying though to do for a long, long time. Um, what are we not doing right? So, uh, so globally, annually large companies spend about $1.3 trillion on change efforts, on trying to transform their companies, get bigger, smaller, grow, get more efficient, more innovative. And uh, the research for, uh, on that is that about 83 to 87% of those dollars are wasted, that change doesn't actually happen. And the reason is there's lots of individual psychological reasons why change is hard. In a corporate setting or an educational setting, uh, the reason why change is hard actually was illustrated to me by a conversation I had uh, with the CEO of Vodafone, Nick Reed, and he was about to take on the job. And he said, in his company, the average tenure is 12 to 15 years, and the average CEO lasts five to seven years. So if you work in an organization, the dominant strategy for you personally is always to passively resist change. You'll always have a new initiative from the top down, whether it's get digital or innovative or figure out how to work remotely. And most employees don't want to be the tip of the spear on that change. They just kind of say, oh, yeah, I'll go along with it and don't do much. So activating people throughout what he called the messy middle and other CEOs have called the permafrost of an organization is actually the central challenge to how do you actually drive any kind of transformation, whether it's, it's a corporation or the government or an educational system. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, does this relate, the other quote I really love, uh, you know, I had to go back and look at your video clips, Lazo. So the, the quote I loved is you basically said that engagement is a BS uh, metric. So, I mean, I'll, I'll bite, you know, I helped to run an organization. We talk a lot about employee engagement. What, why is it misguided? So in the, in the colloquial way that we talk about engagement, you know, am I engaged? Am I having a good time? Do I care about the work? That's fine. Uh, but the way HR departments and consultants tend to talk about it is wrong. So the Gallup organization, which does lots of great, amazing research, kind of started popularizing the phrase employee engagement about 30 or 40 years ago. And what's been interesting is the way they did that work was they did, uh, they used a methodology that's kind of a classic data mining error exercise, which was they took a bunch of company data, how long people have been at companies, um, how the companies perform, and then they asked a bunch of questions and then they looked for correlations between those questions and how people behave. Yeah. And then they said, okay, well, this is gonna be our index. And the problem is their correlations, not causal relationships. Um, what we've kind of subsequently seen in the science is that the things that drive actual human performance are things like connection to meaning, connection to purpose, uh, the concept of flow. There's all these things that actually drive performance. It's not, do I have two friends at work? It's not, do I like my boss? And so, Companies focus on engagement as a metric. And then there's, you average the scores. Um, but it actually doesn't give you a roadmap as to what to do. And it doesn't actually predict what's going to happen. So it's kind of a fundamentally flawed measure. Wow. It's taken hold, though. I mean, that is something that Gallup thing has took hold, as you said, for decades. So 
it's interesting to think about it in light, and we'll talk more about meaning at work and purpose of work as we get into it. Before we dive a little bit in too much into that, um, I think it's helpful just to step back and talk about Humu and what you're doing there, why you're doing it, what like what motivated you um, to want to do this. It's a big change in your own life to to go from what you were doing to this. So, talk about the genesis of it. Yeah. So. Um... So I was on the management team at Google for uh, just over a decade, uh, leading what we called people operations. And what was amazing about it was I was able to build this people analytics team and apply some real science to how things happen inside companies. So we were able to explore questions like, do managers matter? And turns out they do. Um, but there's eight specific behaviors that make them more effective and three that are negative. And if you get those right, you have extraordinary performance. We looked at things like, do teams matter? And how do you drive performance? And the conventional wisdom is the most effective teams are when you get a group of all-stars, of top performers together. But it actually turns out the team culture is way more important than the components of the team when it comes to driving performance. And we did a lot of cool experiments too around nutrition and health. Uh, you know, How do you get people healthier? How do you get them to make better decisions around what they eat and exercise? So after a long time of doing that, I kind of had an epiphany, which was, and it's kind of obvious, but there's 4 billion people on this planet who work. And for most of those people, work's a pretty crummy experience. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, most companies don't care about their people. Most companies don't treat them particularly well. You see a lot of that right now in the downturn. I mean, it's a historic levels of unemployment and, and, uh, and work is not good. And so the idea was, can we take some of what we learned about how do you drive performance and behavior and combine it with actually making people happier? And on the thesis that happier people are also going to be more productive, stick around longer. And it turns out they are. Mm -hmm. And so we started the company to figure out uh, using something called nudges. How do you actually drive positive behavioral change? How do you help people grow yeah. with an outcome of happiness and inclusion and, and eventually productivity? Now, you, you also say that it's technology mixed with a little bit of love. So talk, I want to know where the little bit of love is. Also, the word nudge. Nudge sounds like, doesn't sound like a loving word. It sounds like <laughs> nudge. So where does the love come in? So the love piece is if you, the way it shows up in what we do is, is in a few different ways. Because obviously there's computer science and machine learning, and there's a lot of behavioral science and people analytics. Mm -hmm. um, but it shows up in some very personal ways. So for example, um, you know, we take privacy really, really seriously. Like we think the data belongs to the individual yeah. and you know, we treat that as sacred. We don't resell data, we don't do inappropriate things. We tell you what we're gonna do with the data before we do anything. And then we give it back to you if you want it. And if you don't wanna be included, you can opt out. Um, but there's a deeper piece, which is even in the hardest driving cultures, Fundamentally, human beings want a sense of meaning and connection and to be appreciated. So we end up sending these nudges, which, which I guess we'll talk about, but they're kind of very human. And it's things like at the beginning of the pandemic, the most popular nudge we were sending out to our customers, and, and you could also sign up for free to get these, was to set up virtual water coolers. Just open a meeting, no agenda, just create a moment for people to kind of reconnect and have some social time. And that's that's one of the ways the love shows up. Mm -hmm. And then... So it's the, the, the relationship of finding meaning at work, finding purpose, the Adam Grant stuff that, uh, you know, related back to this idea of kind of creating habits and small things that lead to, you know, you talk about these small things that lead to change. Is it just against this backdrop of you already feel meaning or you already feel some purpose at work or is this helping to build that? No, you have to build it. So. There's a professor at Yale named Amy Rosinski, uh, who's brilliant, and she does work on how do you make work better. And one of the things she found was that across professions, only about a third of people find their work meaningful. So a third of people find it meaningful, a third of it view it as a means to an end, I just got to make a buck, and a third of people view it as a game. I got to get to the top, the next rung on the ladder, I got to get the brass ring. People who find the work meaningful on average are 21% more productive, and they stick around longer. And so the question then becomes, what's different about these people? And by the way, it's true across professions. I was talking to, uh, to a minister and I said, surely if you're a minister, that must be the most meaningful work in the world. And he said, actually, no. He said, even in our line of work, people remember the duty, but forget the joy. 
So the first part is connecting people back to why their jobs matter. The second is things are actually different on every single team inside a company. And so the thing that's going to make that job better, it could be more gratitude, more inclusion, more transparency, more fairness. They've, you know, we, we have a list of about 80 factors yeah. and all those things add up to what academics call a eudaimonic happiness. So normally when we talk about enjoying work, we talk about hedonic happiness, which is I'm smiling, I'm having a good time, I'm high-fiving. Eudaimonic happiness is a much deeper concept, which relates to purpose and flow and this stuff our friend Adam Grant writes about. Mm -hmm. When you key into that, great things happen. Interesting. I mean, but okay, so most places, as you know, are not Google, where you've come from and you spend a lot of time. And I've spent some time there as a reporter and doing different things, and it's a pretty amazing spot. So I'm I'm kind of curious when you went off to you create this company and you think about the typical either client or the typical company, what's in your head like for, cause you said most people aren't really that interested or that deeply engaged. So what is work really, you know, in your mind, like who are you catering to or what, what does the workplace look like in your head? Um, ultimately our mission is look, I mean, the people at Google are going to be fine. Like even a bad day at Google is a pretty good day. And that's true for lots and lots of companies. Um, so commercially today, we focus on large enterprise for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and the companies that use our product are, you know, they're airlines, they're telcos, they're manufacturing companies, they're retailers with, you know, tens of thousands of branches and, and hundreds of thousands or millions of employees. Um, but the piece that's most meaningful to me personally is the fact that we can help, you know, somebody who's doing salad prep at a place like Sweetgreen have a better experience at work because it's, you know, my first job after college was working at an Olive Garden and that was not a fun job. I did not enjoy like, I mean, there were good parts, but like the making the salads, pulling the breadsticks out of the, the warming bit, like it wasn't innately delightful and meaningful and if we can help a place like Sweetgreen or much, much larger companies become more meaningful places for their employees, everyone wins. So that's, those are the jobs we really care about. I mean, much, much, yeah, much broader than the typical uh, Google Googler. And for yourself, I'm just curious, did you experience this yourself at all? Like in terms of developing or changing anything around just the notion of smaller things leading to bigger, I mean, is that something you've gone through on your own? Yeah, the, um, I mean, one, one of the habits that was probably driven by my own insecurity, you know, early in my career, uh, and it's still there, but, you know, it's, it's better masked was, um, you know, every day at the end of the day on my commute home, when we all used to have commutes, I would beat myself up about what did I screw up today? What did I get wrong, right? Um, like even this conversation, like in the back of my mind, there's 5% of me going, oh, my answer's too long. Are they focused enough? Am I, you know, am I being entertaining enough? <laughs> uh, but that daily repetition of practice like that helps you grow and improve. Um, one of the, when the pandemic hit, uh, and even running a company where our whole thesis is these small interventions and reminders are transformative. You think I'd be immune to it, but I was having like a crazy intense week. And the nudge I got from Humu was to take a deep breath, sit back, close my eyes and just breathe for three minutes. And I know all about mindfulness. I know about meditation. I know all this stuff, but it just hit me and stopped me. Huh. So I did it. And, and not just that day, but that whole week unfolded completely differently because I took that moment because I got just the right advice at just the right moment. And those nudges are the way you interact with it are then it's learning about you more and giving you the right nudges. That's right. Yeah. So it, it not only adapts to you personally, but it adapts to the environment around you. Cause this, this is another element of change. Um, it's like, if you want to run a marathon mm -hmm. and you just say, I'm going to run a marathon, yep. you may or may not finish the training program. If you and three or four friends say, we are going to run a marathon, mm -hmm. the fact that all of you are committed and that you're doing it together, you'll miss a few workouts, but you're four or five times more likely to actually run that race. And so part of what's important is not just nudging me as an individual, but it's nudging the people around me. And that's particularly important when you talk about something like inclusion. Too much of the work around inclusion is focused on how do I help the underrepresented person 
make their voice heard or move up or build relationships. And our thesis is one of the biggest levers is actually activating the majority, which means not, not only nudging someone to speak up, but nudging, quite frankly, people who look like me to say, you've been quiet, what do you think? Or maybe even telling people like me, don't say anything, ask questions, don't give answers. The, uh, what, you know, as you talk about the, the pieces of the inclusion work or issues around structural racism that uh, we're really confronting in big ways across corporate America, I mean, so much of the research around things like confirmation biases um, are so deep ingrained, and that's, the, that's the, often the structural part. How can you, you know, what you're doing, how can that help to break some of that or at least move us in new directions? So I think if we, the ideal state is you kind of transform hearts and minds, right? Mm -hmm. That everyone in the world believes everybody is created equal, everyone's endowed with the same rights and people show up and are treated that way. Um, the reality is it's gonna take hundreds and hundreds of years to get there. And I don't wanna wait another 400 years to make progress. So part of my view, my, my opinion, um, is you do need to activate clusters of people. You need to activate the majority. And eventually you're not gonna convince everybody. And for the people who are the outliers who have truly like reprehensible beliefs, like you may never convince them. You might convince their kids and their grandkids. So instead the best you can do is mitigate the behavior by changing the norms. And we've seen this kind of writ large politically, but I'll give you a Google example. When we started doing work on uh, unconscious bias at Google years and years ago, um, at Google, the, being a vice president is a very senior title. If you're an individual contributor engineer, mm -hmm. you don't become a vice president, you become what's called a distinguished engineer. And I remember sitting in the room when we were making the promotion decision for who was for somebody who was going to become potentially a distinguished engineer, and it was a woman. And it was all men in the room myself included. And I was, I was the HR guy, but everybody else was a distinguished engineer. And there was this long, long discussion until one of them spoke up and said, well, gentlemen, and let me remind you that we are all gentlemen. We need to be aware that women at Google are more likely to take on the backend engineering work, to take on the operational work of making sure meetings flow smoothly. And not only has she done that, but she's also been technically superb and accomplished all these things for our users. And there were heads nodding and some more discussion and she was promoted. Huh. And what was amazing about it was, and this was part of the inspiration for, for this idea of nudging, the key to changing the dynamic in terms of how promotion decisions were made were not, was not just sort of raising awareness, but it was that small intervention where he suddenly reminded everybody and said, literally, guys, guys, this thing exists, can we be mindful of it? And then people realize, oh, actually, yeah, we're making an error. So I think one of the ways to make progress and certainly not the only way is you do actually need to activate everyone and in particular people in the majority to mm -hmm. ally better and advocate and, and importantly to step back uh, and listen. Yeah, so, I mean, you're really pointing to that these learnings, the way we learn and develop is clearly, at least if it work, you know, you're talking about a lot of subtleties, but you're also, you know, saying that this is not an individual sport, essentially, you know, this is the, the, yeah, there's an individual component, but there's a group dynamic that's happening and you're trying to play in, I mean, do you, and it's interesting, we, we can move on to other things, but it seems like the Humu technology, at least is accounting for the group dynamic as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, we can, I mean, this is, this is a topic that's near and dear to me, the, um, from a product perspective, you have to, because it's the only way to get change. Like it's, it's rare for an individual to be able to transform themselves by themselves, right? Um, I remember um, I met a guy who, who was a Stanford University student. He told me the story about how, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night. This is like 10 or 15 years ago, 11 o'clock at night, he's going to a fraternity party and it's raining and out there on the driving range, he sees somebody in the rain, in the dark, hitting golf balls. He notices it. it's kind of weird. Four hours later, 3 a.m. in the morning, he comes back. This dude is still out there hitting golf balls in the rain, in the dark, in the middle of the night. And he goes up to him and he says, Tiger, there was Tiger Woods. 
what are you doing, man? And Tiger Woods told him, it doesn't rain that much in Northern California. So when it rains, I need to practice. That's an exceptional thing. I'm not that good and I'm not that capable and I'm not able to force all the people around me to, you know, support me and make things happen. And, and, you know, often we're too shy, we're too embarrassed to ask for help. So the key to transforming things and particularly in the world of like social justice is people like me, you know, as a big executive at Google, like there's a lot of power and, and, uh, you know, like uncle Ben told Peter Parker, great responsibility comes with that. And our strong thesis at Humu is you have to activate those people and the way to do it is not sending them off to a training program that everyone has to go through for a week because that's not gonna stick and it's not in the real world. It's in the moment, giving them just the right advice and the nudges and then reinforcing that behavior over time, making the interventions more and more sophisticated so they get better and better over time. And that- and We all get better. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, you're also touching on how it is that you practice, which is probably an art in and of itself. Um, and something we think a lot about is the, you know, what are you practicing? How are you doing that? As you're saying, kind of this notion of in the, the flow of work, is it, uh, it seems that it's critical that leadership buys into this. Um, this is not a case of something like kind of bubbling up. This is something that leadership needs to buy into to kind of make an organization uh, take on whole or, or can it come from anywhere? Um, well, what we're talking about really is, I mean, for kind of personal development, it can come from anywhere, right? Um, when COVID hit, we offered a free three week package of nudges for dealing with the crisis. And, you know, we had tens of thousands of people sign up in a week on the website. Of, and that was very helpful for individuals, at least based on what they told us and, and the rate at which people came back. Yeah. Um, so if you're in a company and you're trying to work on, you know, making a team happier, yeah, you can do that within your team. But if you really want a transformation, right? And there's like the business jargon, you know, everyone wants to be agile these days. Everyone wants to be digital. There's those kind of transformations. And then there's the more meaningful ones around really being inclusive. Um, there you're talking about inverting the power structure because you need to activate everyone and, and the people at the top often need to learn the most. Um, but those initiatives often do start with the sponsor at the top who says, this is something I care about. So for my division or my business unit or my function, we're going to take this seriously. And then once in a while you get an incredibly enlightened CEO, um, like, like Nick Reed at Vodafone, who I mentioned before, yep. was like, oh, we need to reshape our company. Here's what we're going to do. Yeah. The, let's talk a little bit about the COVID crisis and that piece and how, you know, so much the we now are feeling, I think there's this general sense, or at least some people say it's, you know, we're sort of living with this and we're changed forever. I mean, I'm curious, there's so many ways to go at this. How much of work really is, we think, change forever? There's another piece that I'm really interested in, which is a year or two from now, you know, you're going to have people entering the workforce who are really in a very different higher ed, uh, uh, you know, MBAs in a very different way. Learning is going to be very different. So how they come out after two years in a hybrid learning situation, um, that seems to be that feels like a big challenge for corporations, although I'm not sure what they're even coming out into. Yeah, the, um, that is a big question. Um, <laughs> I think there's going to be a permanent impact on people's careers. Um, the academic research on what happens when you graduate into a downturn mm -hmm. is it suppresses your earnings for your entire career. Um, this was true in the 1993 recession. It was true in 1999-2000. Um, it was true after 2008. What ends up happening is you graduate and your opportunities aren't as great as they are doing a boom, during a boom. And so then you either get a mediocre job or a job that's not as prestigious, the big fancy firms aren't hiring as much, um, or you don't get any job at all. And you do what I did, which is you work at the Olive Garden. I uh, look at that, worked out okay. They were, I got, I have been yeah, so blessed and lucky in my career. I mean, yeah, it worked out great. <laughs> the whole other story is how you went from the Olive Garden to Google. It's, uh, well, <laughs> the, the, so the short version is immigrant family came here as refugees, had no idea. I, I didn't know what big companies were. I didn't know what the Wall Street Journal was. Like, it wasn't a conversation in our house. Like, we just didn't know. Yeah. Um, so I graduated into a recession, end up working at the Olive Garden. 
And uh, then after a year of that, went back to my college career center. I was like, there, there's got to be something that pays better than tips. And got a job at a small manufacturing company where the president was a Harvard dropout who'd gone into construction. And he taught me everything about like corporate America. He taught me like where to buy nice shoes, like what a suit, like what a nice suit looks like. Basic, basic stuff yeah. um, that if you're an immigrant, you don't learn. I took a night school class at UC Irvine. The professor liked me. It was in accounting. He referred me to a headhunter, got me to a consulting firm. And that's when I realized there's this whole big world out there. And then I decided to go to business school, then McKinsey, GE, and then everything else was easier. Um, but graduating a recession on average is really bad for you. So, because um, you end up competing against the people who graduate the next year right. into a better economy. And so I think that's going to be hard for everyone graduating now and the next year, maybe the next two years. Um, I think work's forever going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, although there will be companies of both extremes who say we're going full back to traditional. So AbbVie, uh, pharmaceutical company, they want everyone back in the office. So that's what they're doing. Uh, Tesla, same thing. Uh, then there's other companies like Twitter which say we're never going back. And I think what will end up happening is people will work with smaller footprints um, there'll be more remote hiring. Um, and I think it's going to be a, a systemic change that, that will persist for a long time. Yeah. Is that going to make it, um, if we are more distributed, which is sort of an interesting question, I just wonder to the extent that the way that some of the things you're talking about, how teams work and how we work, live, work, is that also then change? Because we just don't have that communication the way we used to, and it just, Management especially feels different when you can't see everyone every day. Oh, it's 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 completely different in the same way that TV is different from radio and that like interacting online is different from TV. Uh, it's that big a change. So what what I hear from executives is they say, I feel like I've lost one of my senses. What I hear from workers, employees is I'm doing the work, but without the fun. So the what companies need to think hard about in the future and today is number one, you need some way to forge that social connection and technology can help in the right way. And the second is all that money you're saving on real estate, you should use to periodically bring people together. So take the whole company to Disneyland, take the whole company to Hawaii, but bring people together. So they still have those moments of what, what academics call bursty communication, where you can just hang out and get to know each other and really get deep into things. Yeah, no, I mean, um, it, and it, it does seem like we spend so much time, you know, at least in my own career as a media person thinking about community online and, you know, especially in the wake of places like Facebook and others. Um, I'm curious how community and credentialing and badging all relate in some ways. I feel like there is, there are opportunities to learn um, asynchronously and become part of a learning community, or at least part of a community that has acquired some skills or knowledge, and that might relate to badging or to something. But I'm not sure. I mean, it certainly doesn't feel like we've cracked this code, but it almost feels like there's more urgency going forward to figure it out. Yeah, there's definitely more urgency. Yeah. Uh, Maybe more money too. Yeah, I think um, the missing piece is large employers being willing to really take these credentials at face value. Right. So Udacity, Coursera, these are fantastic companies. Um, they have different kinds of credentialing. And then you see on LinkedIn, you can get badges and things like that. And most large companies now have some internal skill tagging mechanism. Um, Google announced some training program. I, I, I actually, I'm not sure why they charge for it. Um, it seems it should just be free, but, um, you know, margins may be getting tighter over there. I don't know. Uh, but what's missing is, and the re actually, the reason I mentioned Google is they've said they're going to consider this the same as a college degree. So to right. be determined if that's true. But that's kind of the missing piece. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot more opportunity for community to form. Mm -hmm. uh, but more than that, to really turbocharge and legitimize those credentials as an alternative to a more traditional education, uh, which I think is the correct thing. You need employers to actually really take them seriously and say, we're going to hire people who have these following credentials. And then market the fact that they're relying on those credentials rather than more traditional ones. I mean, in the US, only a third of people finish college. And 
you can't tell me the other two thirds are any less smart or capable. It's just about access and opportunity and role models. And if we could tap into that other two thirds, it'd be transformative for our, our economy and our nation. I mean, do you think that the higher education itself is doing it right now almost to take advantage of the crisis, if you know what I mean, and change themselves? Um, yes and no. I think, um, I mean, you know, my thesis on everything, including my own performances, I could always do more. I could always do better. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think higher education is distracted because outside of the, the elite universities, there's a real economic question many of those institutions are facing. So mm -hmm. I think they're focused a lot more on how do we keep the doors open rather than, you know, how do we innovate? I think um, what some of the institutions have been doing is really interesting about you know, um, uh, Pomona College, where, where I happen to be an alum and, and a trustee, they've done really, really interesting work when they went to online um, in retraining the faculty and giving the faculty opportunities to learn more about the pedagogy of how do you actually teach online and how is it different? It's not just the same content delivered to a video camera. Uh, in making sure the right resourcing was available for the faculty and for students. Uh, they spent a fortune giving laptops to students. Um, but Pomona is a relatively affluent university, so they can afford to do that. Um, what I'd love to see, um, and I've been public about this before, is, and it's also an amazing business opportunity, is for you know the five or six biggest tech companies who are hardware and software providers and the five or six biggest telcos who are bandwidth providers to basically just say, look, 10% of American children have no reliable internet and no reliable access to a device. We're going to give them all a device and we're going to give them all bandwidth and you know, kind of go up the ladder and see if we can actually make a big change for this country. Um, and by the way, they'd be forming lifelong customers and building tremendous goodwill. Um, so it's a little mystery to me why it's not happening. Yeah, that's, I mean, no, I think it's a real question around, um, you know, are we, you know, uh, I mean, I think in every, the different crises that I've gone through in publishing, which media and publishing have gone through a lot, but there's always this question underneath of like, you know, never let a good recession go to waste, never let a good crisis, like, you know, that's a time to retool, to rethink. It ties to what, where leaders can take us and what's demanded of leaders. And it does feel that that's also something that's changed as well. Like during COVID times and during what we're living through, do you see the demands changing for, um, for you know, what, uh, what people are expecting of the, of the folks who are leading their companies or their organizations? Um, I do absolutely see it changing, but there's an interesting kind of layer to it. Um, so absolutely, people are demanding more from their companies in terms of speaking up about social justice issues, uh, moral and ethical issues, being responsible global citizens, 100%. Um, but because unemployment is so high and not that many companies are hiring, um, I mean, you even see big retailers sort of bragging about hiring 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 people. That's all just replacement. Right? It's not actually incremental new jobs. It's just they have 80% turnover a year, so they have to replace their employees. So what's happening behind the scenes is even in places where employees are saying, yeah, I don't, you know, where, where leadership is saying, we're not going to weigh on this. So the CEO of Coinbase just uh, published a blog about how they're basically only going to comment on political issues that relate to their business, and they're not going to talk about any other issues. They're not going to talk about social justice. And people in that company they're not going to jump ship on day one because there aren't that many opportunities even in tech but it sends a very strong message and behind the scenes what we're seeing and certainly in our data on the who side is that people are just biding their time and when they see leaders fall short of the moral challenge that that is upon us right now and the healthcare challenge they're noticing and remembering and so what's going to happen is once the economy picks up inevitably you're going to see far more people switching jobs because uh, the virtue of being remote is it's a lot easier to interview and switch jobs. So um, it's more important than ever, and uh, companies will be surprised at how strong the reaction is once the economy improves. I mean, it, it also seems that just there's this, I think you're talking also at a big, in some ways, a macro level around the call for leadership around these big, big issues. But it, it also just seems like even on a more uh, day in and day out level that there's a, 
it's easy for people to um, to get a little untethered when you're not coming into work when you don't have that. I mean, I'm not sure what the what's happening with productivity. Um, yeah, you hear, you see in the Wall Street Journal, you'll hear from CEOs, and you kind of see there's mixed results about that. But um, you may have more data on that. And uh, you know what it is that on a day in and day out, the leaders need to be doing to help keep people focused. Yeah. Well, so the, the product story, productivity story is interesting. I had one um, CEO of a retail firm, uh, you know, over 100,000 employees, say that when COVID hit, productivity actually went up about 30 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. um, and then three months later, it had dropped 10 to 20 percent below pre-COVID levels. And what had happened was And everyone saw other companies doing layoffs and jobs getting cut. Everyone was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do my work. Work became a refuge from the fear and chaos in the rest of society. Well, now that we've settled into it a little bit, it's not sustainable, it's exhausting. And so productivity is slipping and that'll show up in, in the national statistics over time as well. Um, the most important thing for leaders to do in this environment is actually, this is gonna sound weird, but put their business second. So yeah, you've got your business goals, you got to get results, you have to performance manage, but you need to first make time to check in with people, to see how they're doing. And it doesn't have to be a political check-in. You can just say like, how are things going? Yeah. Um, a number, I, I know a number of people who've become CEOs and presidents during the pandemic. So they've taken on these enormous C-level jobs, never met their teams. I spoke to one last, last week. Um, one of the practices we put in place at our company is, because three of our eight executives joined after COVID started. We start each meeting with um, like a, a deep question and we just go around the table and everyone answers it. So, so we had our staff meeting this week and the question was, um, you know, somebody referenced the moving sliding doors, which I hadn't seen, but then they said, you know, what's one moment in your life that if it had gone differently, your whole life would be completely different. And we got professional stories, we got personal stories, but we got to know each other a little bit better. And that becomes all the more important in today's environment. Yeah, that seems, I mean, it seems really you know, difficult to do at the same time. Um, you know, uh, we only have a few minutes left. So um, this is more just, I want to know desperately what Greek Sirtaki dancing is and why are you good at it? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so uh, Greek Sirtaki dance. So uh, little known fact, but I guess you've done your homework. Um, <laughs> I at one time held, co-held the world record for Greek sirtaki dance with about 3,100 other people. And um, it's the dance from the old movie Zorba the Greek. Um, I, I don't know how authentic it is, but put your hands on each other's shoulders and you move back and forth and you kick. And uh, yeah. and so uh, I was at a big corporate event and uh, it, it was in Greece and it was amazing. And the whole idea was, let's try to set this record. So we got more than 3,000 people together in a giant football arena and completely lined around it. And we, you know, danced for 15 minutes. How do you, how, and you just, you, is it, I mean, you, there was there much to learn or you just figured like, you just putting your arms around each other and kicking? Yeah, it was pretty much that. that was Usually, although there was like, I mean, you had to have the basic dance down because to get verified by Guinness, they actually send somebody all the way around and they make sure everyone's doing it in the right amount of time and have to be doing the correct dance. Um, so there were no like backflips or anything particularly impressive, but it was it was legit. All right, okay, you, and you still hold that record today? Uh, well, nobody has told me I've lost it. So uh, together with 3,100 other people, yes. Do you get any nudges around it? You know, like. <laughs> There are no dance nudges, sadly. <laughs> that is sad. You got to work on that. If there, that might be, maybe that's the next. You know what? I'm going to leave that space open for you or anybody who's watching this. That is, uh, I will stay clear of that space and uh, it's wide open. That's a billion dollar idea, I think. Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, I don't know. We'll get, I mean, we only have a few seconds. I don't know if there are any questions or not. Um, there are, you're allowed to put them into chat. Otherwise, we're going to let our friend Lasso go. It's the evening here and what uh, in the afternoon there. But uh, um, all right, I don't see a question coming up. So, all right, Lasso. 
I enjoyed this immensely. It was great for uh, to get to know you and um, a little bit deeper about what you're doing. And uh, I don't know if there are any last words that you wanted to add. Uh, only, you know, the little pieces add up. And it matters to every kid in the classroom. It matters to every teacher. And doing a little bit every day adds up to a lot. It doesn't feel like a lot each day. Um, but when you look back, you can make a huge difference in someone's life by taking tiny steps. Yeah, no, I mean, there's really, there, there's huge power in that. I mean, it's going to be fascinating to watch, especially as the, you, you know, over time to see what these small nudges really, you know, the big changes, because you can imagine um, that there's just going to add up to, and we hope, some really big changes around some fundamentally huge issues that we're grappling with today. So um, I want to say thank you to you and to everyone um, at the conference for setting this all up because the people behind the scenes work incredibly hard and um, deserve a, a big thanks for putting this all together. And I got to hope like next year we might have the chat in person or something or I don't know. We'll figure it out. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to next year. Yeah, exactly.